Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. So, welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversation. Today we have Jia Ng in the house. I'm very glad that you're here, by the way. Welcome. Warm, very warm welcome. Thank you. And um, for you out there, so Jia is a nephrologist and assistant professor at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra North New York, and also the publisher, uh, sorry, also the founder of Published MD, which is a consultancy firm and coaching firm to support clinical researchers primarily, not exclusively, I suppose, um, in getting the work published. And you do that quite brilliantly. That's how I discovered your work on, in my case, LinkedIn, where you share a lot of highly useful tips and tricks on it's not really tricks, but best practices rather, um, on how to how to organize your research so that it um, it's now then also easy to get published or relatively easy, straightforward, and to you sensitize researchers on on the best practices. Um, yeah, so nothing more, nothing less. And in a really concise and engaging and, and colorful and, and embracing way. So, so, so let's hear it from you. And as a starting point, maybe if you could add to what I just said, whatever you want. And also well, tell a bit more about your background, what brought you here, where, where you are as a researcher and also entrepreneur um, serving the medical research community and that's where i hold it for a minute so please go ahead and thanks again for joining yeah, us thank you so much joe I, it's my pleasure to be here and and uh so always love connecting with people on linkedin because because people are always very civil and and there's good content there uh a, a little bit about myself i uh, am a nephrologist and actually went into research as like um a side thing i, I started doing a little bit of um, smaller projects and realized that I wasn't very good with the science part. You know, you go into medical school, you learn to be a doctor, but not the science part. So when I did my fellowship, I, I took a master's and learned about research. And after my master's, I came up with zero publications, uh, which was really hard. It's it's almost like you, know, you, you finish training and you have no product, uh, no, no results coming out. And so I can was I just, fortunate. Sorry to interrupt, but can I just hold you there? Like at on a on a undergrad uh, level, they expect you to already publish because for me in bio, maybe it's also a European thing in biological sciences, we were expected to publish sometime throughout the PhD, not before necessarily. Mm. You know, b because I'm a physician, we have we, you know, by the time I did my master's, I was like in the mid-20s already. And my colleagues, they are quote unquote physician researchers. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them are publishing papers, um, not fully researched, but narrative review papers, mm -hmm. uh, case reports, case right. series, you know, but I, I went into the full research route, I had nothing. Mm -hmm. okay. And so just comparing with my peers, oh. I, I was like, oh, I had nothing coming out. Um, That's so also not a fair comparison to yourself. Right. It, it wasn't, but but there were also other people who, who were in the same journey and path was was really getting stuff out. And and that was kind of why am I not being able to publish paper? It was the, the whole transition from, yeah, from the research, how do we tell the story and transforming into the paper? That was the revelation. Uh -huh. uh, and and during faculty, I took that three years to take it really seriously. Okay, this is I need to work on the writing part. And I focus a lot on that. Mm -hmm. And then over three years, 
took a lot of courses, had coaches, and then kind of got into a breakthrough, published a lot at that time. And, and I realized there are people like me mm -hmm. who love the science, but don't know how to tell the story or don't know how okay. to move to the writing right. part. So I'm like, okay, what can I do uh, to, to help people um, mm -hmm. while continuing this journey myself, continuing to, uh, uh, to grow as a researcher, to be a principal investigator, but also guide those who are coming up getting into this journey, how to how to do that at the same time. Uh, so that's kind of my, my journey from being a um, physician to a physician slash researcher. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, also my own experience is I wasn't aware as a PhD student or not to speak about anywhere before then, but uh, through graduate school and and your research education, so to say, we as academics, we acquire so many skills that other people in the industry world or in, in other sectors get certificates for. And we have to sit it through until we have the PhD. And then we still would have to explain to anybody outside academia, this is what I actually know. And it's so unspecific, mm -hmm. specific on individual scale that you or we should bear this a whole other um, sector of us entrepreneurs serving scholars which we also have on this podcast and we had a few conversations on how to customize your CV and your whole appearance mm. line and yes. public profiles that job hunters or employers can actually acknowledge what you have gained as an academic. Yeah. And with that comes also either being a natural writer and finding it easy, as you say, or not <laughs> to, mm. to package your, your findings into text. And most people struggle and that's a normal thing, but you still, we all still have to acquire that skill one way or the other. And most people take the long route by, yeah, hopefully having some guidance from peers mm -hmm. or, um, or yeah, having, having consultants like yourself to guide mm -hmm. them. Right, right. Okay. So, so now we're. We hear you also in in the in our conversations before this uh, recording. You shared with me that you're also a mother, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not asking how did that happen, <laughs> but what I what I would love to <laughs> for you to share with us how did motherhood and also, uh, yeah, how the whole transition of oh I'm pregnant and how can I fit into my research to becoming a mother and changing, putting my my life uh, head over heels, basically. Mm, yeah, so so I actually, um, I became a mother when I was an intern um, during residency program. So for the audience who, does, who don't know what that means is after medical school in the US, um, you actually in, in, in most countries that after medical school, you have you're technically a doctor, but not a fully trained doctor. You still need to go through something called residency program where you do practical. You become a doctor under supervision, like an internship resident, and then you specialize. At first year of my training, um, that's when I had my first child by choice because I was deciding based on biolog uh, biological aging. So mm -hmm. I, I've always had um, some thought that I want to have my children by before I turn 30. And so I had that intention. So mm -hmm. I had my first one when I was an intern, my second child when I was a, a third year resident. And it was hard. It was very hard because most people say internship is the most difficult time of uh, your tra medical training period because you go from the books into the practical part. You know, we're talking long hours, 80 hour weeks, um, there's night shift, day shift. And then I had to nurse, I have to like pump. Um, I, I took a very short maternity leave, only four weeks um, for my first, actually, yeah, six weeks for my first child, four weeks for my oh. second child. Not, and, and also intentional, not because the, the the department wouldn't give me more, it's because I was on a visa. And oh. because I'm on a visa, there's a timeline. You know, I, I have to finish my training before then. If not, if, if not, they're like, oh, sorry, you have to leave. And, and I, I don't want to be in a position where I have to leave when I haven't finished training like that. And then I would have wasted like four years, but nothing. So, so it was some sacrifices that I had to make. Um, but fortunately, I had a lot of support. 
so the the program was very supportive i was the first um resident who had a child who had um no actually i was the second but the older one was a chief resident but he he was very supportive like okay you actually need two months of light rotation he mm -hmm. told me you you can't jump straight into the, the the difficult rotation when you first start come back um you you need time away you need you know so so he was giving a lot of guidance because of his wife's experience and um the attendings or the consultants um really gave, gave me opportunity to to like step away to um to do my nursing and pumping and colleagues would like um say hey let me get you lunch let me hold your pager so so these were like the small things they did that oh. that made such an impact in my life that you know even thinking back I'm like they are going to be such great doctors they're <laughs> going to be such great parents you know all these small things people did for you 10 years ago they're so considerate yeah. they yeah. Think yeah. Long and they're empathetic and they actually act on it also yeah mm. right right and and because of that it kind of created this culture that the next uh intern who wanted to get pregnant they, they felt like oh gee i did it i could do it too mm. and this is what i need to needed to do so yeah. so it, it created a nice culture sweet do you feel like there is room and space and opportunity to institutionalize such supportive measures uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so the more resources they are, the better. And the more people with experience, the better. So so somebody who who is um, really thinking from the, the new parent, it doesn't even have to be only mother, but as a new parent, remember how it is. Um, we forget it's so difficult. We forget you know, um, that the body is beaten up after. Mm -hmm. And the brain is slower. And so that it, I was, you know, the, the star intern may not be a star intern after they come back because they're foggy. They're not as efficient anymore. Just even knowing that sort of things. Like um, being in long COVID. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like the fog that, mm -hmm. that comes back. So so just having that sort of understanding and, um, uh, and, and also redundancy. That's one thing I would say mm -hmm. is that you can't have a program that is so like you have to depend on that eight people. If one comes off sick, pregnancy, the whole thing collapse. We we can't, you know. It always have to be a, a little bit more people to cover more to cover that amount of work than than what's required. That way, when somebody's sick, got an accident, okay, then we reshuffle. So I think that's some cultural thing too, um, where that we we need. Uh, some redundancy not each person needs to like squeeze every juice out of their their career or out of their work hours or effort mm -hmm. but redundancy in the program yeah like building systems i've learned this like first the hard way and then say to realize oh it's not going to work the way i do it but then i took a business growth program for two years where we were very supportive as a community and also had beautiful guidance by the facilitators in building systems to have templates and then to ma actually make use of these and to yeah and to invest in people so that you can have less pressure on each other's shoulders if that makes sense like yeah, on your shoulders right, right. Because... Entrepreneur, but as a team as well Mm. I feel really bad taking maternity leave off or taking time off because when I'm off, everybody had to take over my stuff. And, and it's like my decision became other people's problem, right? Mm. So it, it's like, I felt icky too. So so if the system allowed that sort of uh, a flexibility, then then I, I feel, okay, well, if I my child is sick, I can take time off. I don't feel guilty, you know, because everybody has, has some space has the space and also the information so they know what they can do to compensate. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, but that's also coming back to what you do, like the value that you provide as an entrepreneur to the scientific community. So could you share with us some tips of what you anyways share in social media with regards to how do you, also from your personal experience, how do you encourage a clinical aspiring or actual already um, researcher to organize themselves so that like with the documentation and archiving with the whole team in mind 
like have you have you found a like a folder structure and also a, a folder sharing system that worked for you guys i don't know if you want to mention brand names mm. like a usual well here we come also especially with clinical research i don't think you would ever use google drive even though it's an easy or the regulations are not as harsh in your in in the us as they are in europe but just because there's personal data involved with client uh, patient data but right right but what so what are three things that you could share with the listeners okay here's how you organize yourself as a researcher which also make your personal life easier so you don't have the pressure mm -hmm. uh, that you just described and you can support your team as they chip, chip in to compensate your absence mm -hmm. absence uh, so, so I'm going to start with my, my like a personal first before attacking the team one. So as a personal, I really kind of organize um, my, my time because I, I still have the clinical side and the research side. So I have to kind of do both. And as a clinician, the, the biggest transition is we train as a doctor and we can't let our patients go. Means if somebody says, can you see this patient urgently? And we always want to see them. We always want to take that phone call and then we'll never do science. Mm. So first one I would say is a mindset shift where when I have blocked my time for research time and writing time, I am helping patients. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I'm helping the future patient. I'm helping a thousand patients at a time instead of one patient at a time. So mm. first one was the mindset shift. If not, you can say how you want to reorganize your time but you can't execute it because like, I know I blocked that two hour or that Tuesday is my writing day, but I can't do it because I keep adding patients to my schedule. Mm -hmm. So first is just kind of split. When I schedule it, it's research time, I am impacting. Then second is I, I'm 75% research and 25% clinical. So I deliberately divide all my work. Monday is my full clinic day. I, I don't take breaks, like just clinic, patient, 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 patient. And then on Tuesday morning is where I do all phone calls. I call all patients, like no, you know, nonstop. That that way, I don't waste any time. There's no phone tags. I call patient, then they call me back, and I miss that. You know, these are like time wasters. Okay. So I, I coach my patients. They I usually call on Tuesday mornings for results. Is that good for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, I try to make them do blood tests before. That way, when we see, I see them in the clinic. We are just going through the results. I'll show them the picture. I show them the graph. So it's a meaningful. Um, conversation and 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 a visit right mm -hmm. so so now it's only like one day and then the rest of the week is all my research days okay so tuesday i like to i like to have um two days just for meetings and like administrative tests mm -hmm. so all my meetings with my research assistant the project manager is always on tuesdays meetings conversations are typically on fridays and then wednesdays and thursdays are usually my deep work day where for me, I like like my three hour block to kind of think, to write, or to like think about, okay, which one has a roadblock or a bottleneck? If this one has a bottleneck, I need to like do these three things. That mm -hmm. way I can uh, uh, push the, the ball forward to another person so that people are not waiting for me. So I have like some deliberate organization in terms of time wise. Um, and then in teams, um, how I like personally is, um, to uh two things one thinking about systems so i have personal systems and um research system where i have things like my standard operating procedure all the resources um every time i learn something new like something that's new for me in the for example i need to apply for a uh, patient compensation cards you know every time you recruit patient you need to give them money mm -hmm. so we need special cards for that I'm like oh how do i do that uh, who do I need to uh, uh, find out? How do I apply? What are the forms? Mm -hmm. Every time I know it's something I have to do three times, I immediately create a standard operating procedure. Sometimes I do screen record uh, uh, recording and I put it in my Notion. Mm -hmm. That way, um, the next person who needs to do that, I'm like, okay, every time you do this, this is how you do it. This is the button you need to click. This is the contact you need to email. These are the forms. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have to teach them again. And it, because these are the things that don't, don't happen all the time. I may forget in six months. So I like go back to my repository of my systems repository or SOPs to, to do that. 
So I have like categories for that. Even personal life, I have um, a, a SOP or a notion uh, a dashboard with my family, my husband. So even random things like all the doctor's appointments, the phone numbers, the policies, health policy, life policy, insurance, all these things are there. That yeah. way we're like, okay, is it due yet? Uh, we just look. So, so this is kind of general how I kind of think about my life in systems mm. so that people can replicate. And the personal life is actually more important than you think because especially when you have children, what if I die and now my husband doesn't know all the doctors because I've always been the one who bring the kids to the doctor. You don't have to die right away. You can also get I, I know. and then recover. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like just all these things yeah. that great right. right. sorry yeah i don't want to scare myself off <laughs> let alone <laughs> nurse <laughs> please don't die just yet <laughs> yeah right, right 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 i'm not gonna die just yet but but i do like to be prepared for yeah. for if i'm sick he knows where to what to do yeah without you having to explain much like gosh can i just focus on getting better again don't ask me all these questions <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <it's> right 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 <laughs> okay nice i use notion as well i was gonna drop name brand names necessarily but we've already mentioned i've already mentioned google so why not also notion because it's so brilliant the only thing is to the listeners um so both companies are us-based the information you share through these systems will be um hosted and and probably also investigated in the united states or maybe not investigated uh, by default but could be done so legally um and you might especially when you're from europe we have harsh um, regulations when it comes to data privacy and also patient data so do not put any research data right. on any such system but for that there's systems and photo structures that you can set, set up on a secure server i mean these are also secure service i think google and notion are probably the most secure service or amongst the, the most oh. secure we can find but it's just about the access to that having right. said that also as much as soon as any system is connected to the internet it will be hacked sooner or later as we've seen mm -hmm. western governments being hacked so there's no mm -hmm. sense security right. but researchers we right. want to be accountable and do the best we can i want to be clarified the notion i it's only systems that are non-patient yeah yeah no it's yeah not. sorry i didn't want to excuse you as if and i heard you yeah. also this is for personal and i also yeah, yeah. Use notion for personal stuff and non-personal yeah, systems stuff. research systems but but these are research systems that are not like where i store actual patient data that yeah. that we have like it has to be a hipaa safe all commit that is completely different system we have one note everything has to be like within the universities approved a HIPAA is like the the U.S. thing about patient um, record sharing. So so we we cannot have any identifiers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so just to be clear with yeah. the audience. Yeah. I was glad glad that you also add to that um, clarification. I was, yeah. As I said before, I didn't want to get the impression as if I thought you did that. But but then the good thing is once you have a system, you can transfer it on different platforms, and. Mm -hmm. So the same photo structure, you can also set up on a self-hosted server situation for whichever type of data. Right, right. That's true. That's true. So, okay. So being organized, that helps. I have to admit, I am, uh, I like for the longest time of my life, I, what's the past sense of priding oneself? I pro, I, I prid? No. I was proud to say that I'm not super structured because I thought it was a cool thing. <laughs> and, um, so that I live in the chaos. In German, we also have this phrase of saying where it's like, oh, life is all about structure. I live in, the no, half of life is all about structure. I live in the other half kind of thing. So uh. <laughs> it's like, well, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> but I can testify that the real life scenarios are only funny so long until you face your chaos it's like what mm -hmm. the heck have i done and not done <laughs> and, um so building structures and systems actually makes the life easier mm -hmm. and especially as a entrepreneur and even was oh just as much as a researcher and most researchers at least on the biosciences i think clinical researchers are more organized by default 
as a type of people because they have I don't know that's just my personal non-scientific based uh, observation my biologists tend to be like super chaotic and all obsessed with oh nature and complexity it's so nice and yes it's chaotic but that's it's supposed to be that way <laughs> because good things come out of it mm -hmm. <laughs> and they do also in entrepreneurship so there is some logic to it but some structure is still there and yeah. natural that is the important thing for us so structure we've covered that and now when it comes to to publishing um so what, what's like one thing you like to share what's what's for you personally from your own experience also as a clinician as a researcher as a practitioner um why is it for you important to inform other scholars and how to publish like what what's your motivation in teaching how to publish as right. you just said earlier like is adding right. to that a little bit so at, at the beginning it, it was really just you know i i think this is going to be helpful for somebody because it was very painful it was difficult um and you know let me see what i i can share if i can help one people move up a step that would be good and then it slowly evolved into hmm, i i went into science to help patients right the, the, to the increase the impact when i see clinic patients i help one at a time uh, when i publish a paper maybe i can help a hundred or a thousand at a time depending on the impact and what sort of research i'm doing um, but if i can help a thousand physicians or, or uh, clinicians publish their papers that means my impact is like a hundred times a hundred or a thousand times a thousand that means i'm helping a, a million patients or 10 million patients at a time and so, so that became like um, mm. even a small thing, not a small thing, even a thing that was born out of pain could be so impactful. And I love small things like that. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. So, so that's how I, it came to be. Um, and and I realized that when I did that, you know, when you start to try to teach people, the better you get and the more you learn. And so I was getting a lot of pleasure and and um um. Uh, uh, I was getting a, a lot of insights out of it and I, I felt like I grow I grew through learning about writing communication and all the transferable skills as I pursue this journey um, like even thinking about work-life balance when I had no side business um, I was using my time a little bit more loosely then until I took on another thing now like okay it has to be more structured I think about systems. So compared to some of my peers, I started thinking about systems like three years ahead. Mm -hmm. When I need systems now because I have no time to do anything else, if not, right? So it kind of pushed my growth a lot further. Um, thinking about completing projects means you are you are um you you grow to be somebody who can complete things, finish things. Um, you can communicate better, like not just writing, but speaking. Because mm -hmm. how you how you write is how you think, and how you think is how you can speak better too. So, so there were a lot of small things that are intangible and, and I grew, uh, I, I learned a lot out of it. Yeah, I, I can, uh, I have similar experiences in my teaching and mentoring and coaching. All right, um, so I would, thanks for sharing that by the way. Um, not by the way, but actually, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> And um, now we, you mentioned earlier briefly that you, as a, with a migrant status, and please correct me, I, I think you came to the United States as a small child or were you even born here, but you had- uh, No, I, I, I came here to do residency training for medicine. Oh. Um, yeah, oh. so 2012, I came in with okay. visa. All yeah. right. Either way, so there's many reasons why people have migrant sta status. And then are in grad school or whatever um, research education program. Um, so, and you said it was, it put on pressure. And I want to go back there and like, if you could share your personal journey in how you found a way to mitigate the pressure or to like also people, systems, ref references and resources that helped you. Mm. Um, 
because there's a lot of people that do graduate school in a different country, which comes with similar, if not the same challenges that you've been experiencing. Right. And yeah, and I think it's one thing to just share the story to let others know, look, I've been through this and yes, it's been hard, but here we are and it's gonna, we can pull through this and here's how I managed. Mm. So, you know, every visa situation, every country is different. Um, so I'm going to just give my story based on what, what I went through. Um, I, I came with something called H1 visa where it's like a, in medicine, there is a, a large number of uh, foreign graduates or non-US doctors who, who they need to, uh, they need doctors here. So, so that's why they take in foreign uh, graduates. That's number one. And then um, I come from Malaysia that H1 can be transferred into a green card or permanent resident after certain years and if another employer is willing to sponsor it. And so I was going through that route, um, but the, the deadline for that, that first visa is seven years. And so I had this time pressure of, okay, I, I need to finish my thing within seven years. And then in the meantime, find an employer who can like sponsor my green card. So there's always this background thing that I'm always worried about. And then my spouse, when he first came in, he could not work because um, at that time, the visa is the spouse of H1 cannot work unless they get a, a, a working visa by themselves. And so for the first two years, he wasn't working. I was having like a minimum wage salary supporting two mm -hmm. people and a baby. And then um, he got... He finally got a job in software consulting and where he got his own visa. Mm -hmm. And then his company actually sponsored the green card a lot faster. Oh, nice. and so, yeah. so then I became a, a permanent resident. Um, and, and the thing about um, visa and all is that sometimes when, when you choose a program, how, how we got, get these visas is based on how we match which program. Some program will sponsor certain type of visa. Some are like student visa, some are exchange visas. The one I specifically won was this H1 so that it could eventually become a green card. And mm -hmm. so there were programs that were probably at like a more fancy place, higher name, but did not just get this visa. But I was quite strategic that, you know, when it comes to the US, the visa status and your um, uh, citizenship status or green card status is actually more important than where you would train. And so I, I needed that, that, that type of visa after that, once you switch type, doors open mm -hmm. because uh, people who were in like fancy um, Ivy League uh, residency program, but still on a different type of visa could not move forward until they have to go somewhere else, change the different type of visa. So, so I, I had like strategic plans when it came to choosing which type and knowing that I just need to suffer a few years. And then after that, after a certain point, doors will open for me. So, so think about I don't have specific advice for each individual person, but really yeah. think about long-term rather than the short-term, you know? We like to say, oh, I want to be in Harvard. I want to be in that, but and do they give that type of visa? You know, are they going to switch? Are you going to be long-term worse off? Like really think truly about the long-term plan, not just the short-term. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And also to trust that resources are available. You can do some desk research on your own. You can inquire support and assistance. You don't have to figure it all on your own. Right. Just ask around. People have already done that and which approach they took. Um, also, yeah. we, we actually had lawyers. You know, when it comes to visa, you, you definitely need lawyers' help. Um, mm. you, you can't like, file all these things yourself. So get uh, uh, lawyers who are specialized in certain type of visas. Like, oh, yeah, immigrant visa. You, you can't just get any lawyer because they are specialized in different things. So yeah. make sure you choose one who is like, okay, immigrant visa. Another one is um, contract visa, you know, contract lawyer, or different type of lawyers for different things. Yeah. All right. When you say lawyer, isn't that expensive? Just generally speaking. But then um, right. it might save a lot of time and maybe there are also yeah. a lot of right. Yeah. You, you, you want a good one um, so that they do it properly. Unfortunately, such like many cases vital, not life threatening or life saving, but otherwise um, bureaucracy vital <laughs> information is not necessarily readily readily available on the internet. 
but there might be some guidance that you can find out yourself. Otherwise, find, find an expert to guide you. Mm -hmm. Right, right. All right. Um, now, I think we covered all the talking points we've just, we've agreed upon. So building resilience with motherhood. Okay, so now concluding for maybe the last two, three minutes, how would you summarize your journey as an, or how is your life today bringing together your professional status as a medical researcher slash practitioner, clinician, as an entrepreneur, as a mother? How does that, it seems like you're, you've sorted it out. You're well organized. You have your systems <laughs> in place. Of course, there's some tweaking and adapting and adjusting here and there along the way, like maintenance, but are you in a happy place today or what's missing to be there? So either yeah. it's, it's fair. Oh, it's such a great question. Um, if you asked me this question six months ago, I would say, yeah, you know, I, I'm on track on everything. And then over the past six months, I, I started to reflect more. I think, you know, we, we go through a different growth journey. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been, let me do everything structured. I, I love organization. I like systems. I like everything very as structured as possible. I like to use up every single free time for productivity. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that's not quote unquote inefficient, I don't like doing. Uh, you know, I, I will have ear pods everywhere so that I'm always listening to either a course or a podcast. It has to be educational, you know, it can't be, um, it can't be entertaining, no music. I, I don't believe in music. It has to be, you know, I'm always about efficiency. Wow. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Which is actually not good. And, and um, but it can be, that's your way to relax. I think it's fair. Don't beat yourself up. You know, if you come to talk uh, just after, but, but, you know, then I realize is that I constantly have input in my uh -huh. mind. Okay. No, I don't have space for the brain to process. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so when you don't take the space to process, um, you, you're just having things just going through, passing through the mind, mm -hmm. and you're not really using the brain to make connections and think and apply all these things that you have listened from the podcast. Like, huh, I wonder if that is useful. Is it not? Am I feeling good about this? How can I apply this to my science? Oh, can I apply this to my um, a personal life? Can I apply this to my research? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I did not have that space yeah. uh, to, to think. It's not like I did not. I just did not give that the opportunity hmm. to do that. And, that and what people say when you speak of digesting the information to actually processing yeah. and weighing. Process, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. But, but you actually. Or implementing even. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm that little space in between which is really important and uh my research assistant asked me recently is there any inefficient thing you you do um that that you you're inefficient and it really made me ask oh, wow i never do anything like that so so it became more deliberate that there are inefficient things that i should start doing which is um when i walk my kids to the bus stop not have anything in my ears and just enjoy the air enjoy the birds um, so that if they decide they suddenly want to say something I'm ready to catch mm. the funny things they say you know if not I, I I used to be like okay if you want to tell me something you pause I'll take off you can mm. tell me but but it's no longer organic yeah. um, and you lose you lose that like spont spontaneity and so I would say this quarter I'm going to give myself more space mm. um, to to think where uh, not just to think but to process Mm -hmm. um and one more thing i was also going to this concept i learned is a japanese word called ma okay which is the in-between space between everything in between space of time mm -hmm. in between space conversation and mm -hmm. these are not vacuum or empty space but act an actual presence okay all these dark spaces are actual presence and we forget how important it is because if you think about speeches that are really important they tend to pause mm. to give the presence and energy, right? The so allow the listeners to, to actually hear. They what get, you're... yes, yeah. they, they get the tension, they get ready for it. But you were like, if you're little, 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 all nonstop, you sound like, you sound so nervous. You can't process, like you, you don't have enough gravitas. So so it's it's this in-between spaces and actual presence that I want to start cultivating. Um, and not just in the speech way uh, sense, but in every part of my life, let me create the, the, the space in between. 
I think it's also a burden that our generation has as in the digital era, because I I try to unlearn this or to kind of um, build this back, the habit of I'm calling my mom to check on her, how are you doing? And oh yeah, I'm checking in just to have a chat. And then at the same time answering emails and she right. notices and it's like, you're not listening or right. you're hearing me, but you're not actually listening. And that's so mm. disrespectful. She actually gets mm. upset and angry. Mm. And first I was like, oh, come on, give me a break. I have work to do, but it's so unfair. It's also mm. so harmful to our relationship. And then also when you, like when you said earlier, like for kids, when they feel they have to interrupt their parents to get their attention from whatever they think important they're doing. And then, oh, I just want to share, look how beautiful the sun shines today. <laughs> or, oh, have you seen that funny spot down there at the road? Yeah. At the road. Right. They want to share that. And they have a right. Yeah, to they're going to like keep it. They're like, oh, I guess it's not that important. You know, they will keep that thought to themselves. And then, yeah. right, if you don't give them the space to, interrupt you spontaneously and engage it's so important to engage for any human being at any time and age but especially for kids so well done for for taking this journey i think that like with the digital era there's so much pressure also the information age we're in like i don't think humans had to ever process so much information through mm. so many different channels yeah. and being on right. alert like I, it's been a few years now that I shut off any notifications on my phone and I see colleagues and friends having them on all the time with sounds and what I was like how can you live that way like it's still stressful to, to me for me even with those things switched off but huh. <laughs> like we're, we're not doing each other any favors and the efficiency suffers so bad right right and so, yeah, yeah, not everything has to be efficient, you know. I, I think when when you're but what I'm saying, sorry, like the efficiency, if we think we're being overly efficient by kind of multitasking or whatnot, which is basically mm. not possible for our brains. Right. But to come to that realization takes so much time and, and try and error and more errors. Like I've done, I think I spent 70 years on that. Oh yeah, I'm so good at multitasking. No, I'm not. Because yeah, we're yeah. actually switching between tasks and the brain takes time to dig into one task. Mm. It takes like, at least two, three, five minutes to get into like what what I think also runners call the runner's high. You have to run for 20 minutes until you get there. Mm. And for mm. any task to be processed, be it writing an email, it takes half a minute to get into the space of the content and what am I doing here before you're actually doing the work. And if we keep interrupting ourselves and being distracted, we just we take an hour for something that could be done in three minutes. Like I've yeah. observed myself long enough on a, too many of such situations. And now I'm trying to practice the like things like that's what I share in my in the project management and time management courses things like the Pomodoro technique and to give yourself like dedicated time also what you said earlier ch chunks of time for one thing to do taking care of patients being approachable to patients half mm -hmm. a day that day in the week and then they feel they're being taken care of they have feel somebody's listening actually listening not just hearing stuff oh. and oh. yeah and it's it's doing us good as well right 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 <laughs> sorry i got into a monologue here like <laughs> my whole efficiency no what i where i interrupted your apologies is like so there's that part we think we are being efficient and we're actually achieving the opposite mm. but in the long term maybe short term it seems as if but long term it's really not but it's right. a good thing we, we came to notice that. <laughs> yeah, I can't agree more. Like sometimes speed it's is not efficient. We may think it's efficient, but speed itself may not be efficient if, if yeah. you look at the big picture in long term. Right. Yeah, I have like the whole thing with the strategic reading, like academic reading, and then there's things like speed reading. It's really not like you can't speed read a research article, you just cannot. You need yeah. to know kind of strategically approach with specific questions what am i going to learn what do i want to learn from this article mm, I'm looking yeah. for? and that has right. nothing to do with speed but you become more time sensitive and more time rewarding by having by being strategic about it and that will save time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <sighs>
it's not that I have my, like that I know all of these things how to do them in practice when theory it works perfectly. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Like um, there are so many AI tools now teaching you how how do you read fast? How do you? It's not really reading. Just summarizing. I've test tested all of it. I I've tried six months to like. See, you know, an elixir for me. Then I realized, oh, I, even though they've done all the work, I don't remember any of them, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So at the, at the long run, yeah, it appeared, it gave the appearance that I read a lot of papers, but nothing was in the mind. And the goal of reading the paper is to have ideas and insights bubble up. And to do that, you actually have to engage and really dig into the paper and read. And it's the goal is to learn and to not to have eyes passing through words, right? Speed reading is eyes passing through words, and that's not the point. The yeah. point is to gain something out of it. Exactly. Cool. That's a nice wrap up. Thank you so much for this session. And I'm sure we hear more of you. We like um to the listeners, you will find all of Gia's um profiles and and contact details as in LinkedIn profile and uh, Instagram and others where you can follow your work uh, yeah and we have more things to talk about as we've touched upon <laughs> thank you so much for sharing so much with us today and welcome. thank you so much for having me thanks for joining us to listen to this episode do let us know what you think you can email us or connect with us on our social media channels which you can find on our website at access to perspectives.org Email us at info at access to perspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.